right, Rev students, I, I have a question for you. Um, I'm going to be going to the beach in a couple of weeks, and if you've been here for any amount of time, you know that the beach is my absolute favorite place in the whole wide world. I'm so excited about it. I love the beach, uh, but I want to ask you a question. Where are all my beach people at? Raise your hand if you're a beach person. Okay, a good bit of y'all. All right, for all of, all of my beach people, I have a question for you, and if you're not a beach person, you can answer this question as well. Um, what percentage do you think at any time in the ocean that there is a shark near you? If you, if you, know, if you know the answer, don't answer. If you know it, just I, I want you to, to think about it for a second. I want you guys to think about it for a second. Put your thinking caps on. All right, if you think it's above 50%, raise your hand. Okay, if you think it's above 75%, keep your hand raised. More hands went up, I'm not sure. They're like, no, 80%. Okay, some hand was out. If you think it's above 90%, keep your hands raised. If you think it's above 95%, keep your hands raised. I, I see hands going up and down. I'm really confused about how you guys are doing math. I feel like I already knew it was different than I did math, but I feel like now it's really different than the way that I did math. All right, you can put your hands down. So studies show at any point in time, there is a 97% chance that there is a shark within a football field of you. I have some pictures to illustrate for you guys. And so at, at any point in time, there is a shark within a football field of you. Now, here, here's what I think some of you might think. You're like, I could do a football field. Like I've ran a football field, that's pretty long. I said within a football field, it could be 10 yards, right? I said within a football field, it could be 10 yards. Here is the good news. St statistically speaking, there is a super, super, super low chance that any of you will ever even be around a shark attack even happening. So you can breathe, breathe for a second. But there, 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 there's a very low chance that you will be a, even around, not that it would just happen to you, but that you'll even be around one. And so, so if you are a beach person like I am, I'm, gonna, I'm going to wade into the waters confidently in a couple of weeks. Uh, but, but here's the reality. As you go in the water, there is unseen danger around you, right? Like you don't know that it's there, but, but it's a reality. There is unseen things around you. And the reason that I, I bring that up is in the same way that there are the unseen realities of sharks around you in the water. Right now, as we move through our everyday life, there is a unseen reality of supernatural things happening around you all the time. And that might be a weird concept for you to, to, to think about, that, that at all times there is this whole world of spiritual realities and supernatural things happening uh, that you can't see and that you are unaware of. And so specifically uh, when it comes to this idea, uh, for us in the church uh, and for where we're going today, I want us to narrow this term of, of supernatural. When we say the word supernatural, uh, super is a prefix, so it means superior or above. So we're saying things that are superior are above the, the natural world around us. And uh, for us in our time together, the, the things that we're gonna talk about, because it's a very broad, expansive topic, uh, is the idea of uh, angels and demons and spiritual warfare. And so maybe some of those terms are new to you. Maybe some of those terms are weird to you. Uh, to be honest, most people are fascinated by this to topic, Hollywood especially. H Hollywood is fascinated by the topic uh, of the supernatural, specifically angel and demons. Just a, a quick search this year, uh, two of the top 10 movies are based around the ideas of angels and demons, right? Like that, that it, it's a very popular idea. Uh, I remember uh, growing up, it was probably about, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, uh, I remember uh, seeing the trailer for a movie, and I kid you not, this is the, the theme of the movie, uh, that God was tired of humanity's sinfulness. He was just done with it. And so just as one time he flooded the earth, now that he was done with humanity, he was done with the earth again, and he was sending his army of angels. So that's the plot line of this movie. And you, you find this small band of, you know, unsuspecting people 
uh, at this restaurant as this attack starts out. But there was one angel that rebelled against God to save humanity, and that was Michael the archangel. And so Michael the archangel shows up at this little restaurant to, to protect uh, this group of humans and, against the armies of God. And you want to know what he protected them with? Machine guns, rocket launchers, flamethrowers, right? Up against the armies of God, that is what he's doing. That's, that's Hollywood's perspective. It, it, it's almost like, I heard it uh, explained this way once, it's almost like uh, Hollywood came uh, on a Sunday morning and maybe some of your younger brothers or sisters that are over in Rev Kids came out and they had like a little you know, stick figure of an angel and they say, hey, what'd you learn today? And they're like, um, there are angels and uh, they were fighting other angels. And then G.I. Joe showed up and someone pulled out a lightsaber. And that, 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 is, that is the equivalent of what the, the ideas that they have. And, and that's what a lot of people, it's so easy for them to begin to believe that we could begin to be influenced by all these other ideas in the world around us because we are fascinated by the supernatural. It's easy to be influenced by it. Uh, C.S. Lewis, uh, if you don't know him, uh, Chronicles of Narnia, he was a great writer. He was a uh, professor. Uh, he wrote uh, a, kind of about this topic of the supernatural. He says, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the supernatural. One is to disbelieve in their existence the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. Here's how I would paraphrase what he said, and it's our first point for the day. There are super, supernatural forces at work at all times, and we need to be aware of them, but we don't need to be obsessive over them. There is a reality. There are supernatural forces at work, and we do need to be aware of them. Like we need to have an understanding, we need to have a knowledge of it, but we don't need to become obsessive over it. And so like I said, for, for our time today, we, we are gonna be taking a 30,000 foot view, looking down and just trying to get a, an understanding of it. Uh, some of the things I say as I'm trying to answer questions you might have might give you more questions. I probably don't have time to answer every question that you have today. That's what your small group leaders are for. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna talk about something. I wanna, maybe some of you believe some wrong things and I wanna address some of that today. And so uh, for our time today, this whole series paradigm is about uh, a set of beliefs, a pattern, a way to think. And, and for us today, we've been trying to answer questions in the series and the questions that we kind of want to uh, lean into today are, are what are angels and demons? Are they, are they even real? And, and how are we supposed to respond to the supernatural? So that's, that's what we're doing today. Uh, our, our first, we're mostly going to be in Luke chapter 11. So if you have a Bible around you, uh, that's where we're going to be uh, for the majority of our time today. Uh, but we're going to start off with this passage in Ephesians chapter 6, uh, verse 6, 12. Uh, this is the Apostle Paul uh, addressing the, the, the reality of the, the supernatural. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Right here, Paul is affirming the idea that there is some type of supernatural battle taking place that is more than what we can just see right in front of us. And that we need to not only be aware of it, but we need to be prepared for it. And so when it gets to the ideas of, of angels and demons, I, like I said, I feel like we're, we're influenced by the movies that we watch and uh, the music that we listen to and all those things. To be honest, if for, for maybe, I know for my generation, I'm not sure about y'all, when I think about angels and demons, the, the first image that comes to my head is this picture right here. This, this is the first thing that my mind goes to, right? Uh, if you don't know this, this is Kronk. Uh, he is a super awesome guy, right? Uh, and so, but, but that's what we think. We feel like sometimes it feels like we have this uh, little good positive voice on this side telling us good positive things. And then on this side, we have this bad evil voice and it's telling us bad evil things. And we're kind of in the middle trying to figure out, oh no, which one do I listen to? What do I do? And that's what 
uh, we can begin to believe and let influence our decision-making and let influence how we do things and what we believe. And so uh, for our time, the, the, the first piece of our time is I want to look at some myths. And, and when I say myths, these are, these are things that we don't believe is true, uh, but a lot of people do believe is true. Uh, and so about angels and demons. And so uh, these aren't going to be up on the screen, but if you want to write them down, you're more than welcome to. Uh, myth number one, that there is this even battle of good versus evil. There is this even battle of good versus evil. That, that it's something like Star Wars, like there's the light side and there's the dark side and they're, they're fighting against each other and we don't really know who's going to win. That, that is not the, the story that the, the Bible tells. It says that God is all powerful and everything else isn't. And so that means that the forces that oppose God are going to lose. It actually says that they're going to lose in the Bible. It's not this even battle and we're just really hoping our side wins. No, no, it says that God is all powerful and that, that Jesus and through what he did on the cross, that that was the finishing blow and we're just waiting for it to work itself all out. There's not an even battle of good versus evil. God wins. That's, that's the only truth. Myth number two, that we turn into angels when we die, that we turn into angels when we die. This is often a very comforting thought, but it's not a, a biblical one. Angels are separate created beings. Scripture actually says that they are of a higher order than us. They're, they're separate. They're created with more power than we were created with. Uh, they, they're created with a, a different type of mind than we're created with. And so they are uh, a different being than us. And so we don't change into something else uh, when we die and go to heaven. Um, so we don't turn into angels, uh, but there are uniqueness of each thing. The, the uniqueness of humanity is our relationship with God. God puts his spirit in us. And so we have a relationship with God that angels don't have. Like we should celebrate that. Like that is an awesome, amazing thing that, that we are the only ones that get to experience. So myth number two, that we would turn into angels when we die. Myth number three, that we all have a guardian angel, right? I'm stepping on all the toes today, all right? That, the idea that we all have a guardian angel. And so this is not a, a biblical idea either, that, that we all have this specific guardian angel that is following around, protecting us from evil. And, and a lot of times that thought is influenced by the other one, that the, the, the being that is protecting us is somehow close to us relationally, and so that's not, there are angels that do protecting and they do a very good job at it, uh, but it's not this idea that, that each of us have this individual protector. Um, and so uh, these are very common beliefs that, that a lot of people have. You'll, you'll, you'll hear it very often. Uh, myth number four, that we are supposed to pray or command angels to do things, that we pray to angels or that we would command them to do things. Uh, when we're instructed about how to pray from Jesus, he instructs us to pray to the Father. And the Father is the one that commands the angels and commands the armies and commands all the things. Uh, there, there are different uh, belief systems that would tell you you are supposed to pray to angels, and that gives you uh, access to, to more power and special privileges and things like that. And, and that is also not a biblical concept. Uh, we, we are instructed by Jesus to pray to the Father because he is the one that has all the power. And he's the, the good, gift-giving Father that wants to answer the prayers of his children. The last one I'm going to talk about, myth number five, that demons can possess believers. That demons can possess believers. Uh, you see this in, in movies and in all kinds of things like that. Uh, demon possession is a very, like I said, Hollywood is obsessed with this idea. And this is an idea that we see in scripture that, that demon possession can happen. We're gonna read about it in just a minute. But, but when the Bible talks about it, for someone who is a believer, that means they've placed their faith and trust in Jesus and God has taken his Holy Spirit and put it inside of that person and that that is a seal of, of their eternal future, that the power of God is inside of believers, his children, and there's not another power that can do anything with that. They can't take over it. They can't overpower it. Uh, when God talks about it in, in 1 Peter, he says, nothing's gonna snatch you out of my hand. I, I am holding you in my hands. You are secure. There's no power that can mess with that. And so for those of us who are believers, that is 
uh, should, should make us feel safe, make us feel secure when it comes to the supernatural. And so those are, those are just some very common myths uh, that are out there. And so uh, I want us to, two more things and we're gonna get into our text today. I wanna real quickly define what an angel is and what a demon is. And I'm gonna be real quick about this and we're gonna get to Luke chapter 11. Uh, an angel is a spiritual being made by God to worship and serve God. Uh, they don't have physical bodies but are visible for specific purposes. You see throughout scripture where uh, an angel shows up and might perform some supernatural feat or there, there's times where they're sharing a meal with people or things like that, but they don't have uh, physical bodies. They are primarily spiritual beings. Um, the angels relay divine messages from God to mankind. That's one of their primary roles. And then there's some angels were actually created to, uh, to fight, to be, to be at war, to, to fight uh, evil. And so these are some things, and uh, I have Scripture references, if you have questions about any of those, we just don't have time to look at every single one of those. And then it gets to, so if that's what an angel is, what is a demon? What, what, is, what is the evil that we talk about? And so there, there's so much, we could spend the whole time talking just about that right there. But at some point, after God began creation, but before God created mankind, the angels he had created started to rebel against him. And a third of those angels rebelled against God led by Satan. And those are fallen angels. It says that God cast them out of heaven. And those are what we refer to as demons. Their primary purpose is to try and thwart what God is doing. To try and stop the plans of God. To try and steal the glory of God. And so they actively oppose the work of God, and they primarily do this by tempting mankind away from God. So like I said, Hollywood is so fascinated about the supernatural and demon possession and all of these things, but the primary uh, way that we see evil spiritual forces work throughout Scripture and what is explained to us is that their primary role is to tempt mankind. That is what they are trying to do to pull you away from who God created you to be, to pull you away from the, experiencing the goodness of God and what he has for you. And so I, 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 now that we have a, a brief understanding, like I said, I'm, I know I'm pulling up a fire hose and just spraying you guys down with information. Um, I want us to look at how Jesus responded when he encountered the supernatural because based on how Jesus responded to the supernatural, that's gonna inform how we respond to the supernatural. So, uh, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 11, verse 14. It says, now he was casting out a demon that was mute, he being Jesus. When the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke, and the people marveled. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, while others, to test him, kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. There, there's a lot of stuff going on in this text that seems very strange to most of us. There's uh, demon possession taking place, causing someone to be mute. Jesus is casting out that demon. He is showing his power and authority over spiritual forces. And then you have people ascribing the, the work that Jesus is doing as something that is evil and, or demonic so many different things we could talk about. Here is what I want you to, to see that's happening here. Jesus encountered the supernatural because the supernatural is a reality. Jesus encountered it. He sends this demon out. And as he's doing that, the people that see that, mostly because of their own pride and their own jealousy, that they did not have the power to do that, accuse him of working with the devil. And so Jesus responds to that idea in verse 17. He says, but he, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. And if Satan is also divided against himself, how will he, his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub, and if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges." But if it is by the fingers of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. 
Jesus responds to them by being extremely logical in this situation. He says, if, if you're saying that me and Satan are on the same team, then we're not being really good teammates right now because we're, we're working against each other. I know a lot of you play sports uh, and different things. If you are about to, whatever your sport is, score a goal, make a point, do, do the thing that you are supposed to do, and your teammate is actively stopping you from do that, that's not great teamwork, right? Like, I feel like we can all understand how that would work. If you're a, a soccer player and you're about to make the shot and your teammate slides in front of you and kicks the ball out of bounds, like, that's not great teamwork. Uh, if you play basketball, right, and you're about to shoot the three-point to win the goal and your teammate comes in and packs the shot, right, that's not great teamwork. That's the, the logic that Jesus is using here. He says, if I am on the team of evil, then, then why am I casting out the evil in this situation? And then he calls them, he says, and if, if you guys aren't on my team, wh whose team are you on? He begins to, to question them. And the point of this is that, like I said, there's so much going on here and things like that that we could get into. But again, that, that there are supernatural forces at work and there are supernatural forces that are at work at, for you. And there are also supernatural forces that are at work against you. And this passage primarily isn't about our interaction with the supernatural. It's about Jesus's interaction with the supernatural. And because of how Jesus interacts with the supernatural, we can see how we should respond. Uh, Jesus follows this up by telling a story, as he often does. Luke 11, verse 21. He says, when a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. Th this is a, can be a, a really complicated text to understand. I was having a conversation uh, with someone the other day, and they're like, yeah, like this is, this is tough. There's a lot of things going on here. Uh, because of the context, like I said, if, if we read this encounter as a story about us versus evil, we're going to come to the wrong conclusion. This story is about Jesus versus evil. And so when it says a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe, uh, it is talking about the devil. It is talking about Satan. And, and when it says that word goods there, uh, it's not a wrong translation, but it would be better translated as belongings, our possessions, that the things that he has control over, he keeps safe, and it's talking about those that don't know Jesus. It says that the, the other places in Scripture, we'll get to one of them in a minute, it says that the enemy is the ruler of this world, that he has power over this world, and right here, this text is saying that he is the strong man. He is stronger than us, and he has us captive. He has his, his possessions contained. Listen, we, we are under his power unless something outside of us acts on our behalf. We have an enemy who is superior to us in every way. He is stronger than us. He is smarter than us. He is more powerful than us. We are in desperate need of help. The, in Ephesians chapter two, Paul uh, talks about this. It's not gonna be up on the screens, uh, but I just want you to see it begins to talk uh, a little bit about how he works. It says, and you who are dead in your trespasses and sins, we just talked about that just a second ago. The, the, before we knew Jesus are those that don't know Jesus are, are under the control of the enemy, the ruler of this world. It says, uh, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passion of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just like the rest of mankind. What he is saying there is that there is a way that the enemy works in Corinthians, it says we, we should not be unaware of the way that the enemy works. And the enemy works based off of this text in pr three primary ways. The, the devil works doing uh, ordinary acts of evil and extraordinary acts of evil. So when we think of things like this text and look at something like demon possession, the, the, the devil is actively involved in supernatural evil works just like that. But he's also 
involved in ordinary acts of evil, tempting you to lie, tempting you to be disobedient, tempting you to believe that your way is better than God's way. That that is his primary focus, like I said, is to try and get you to believe the same lie that he told Adam and Eve, that if you would just do the thing that you wanted to do, then you would be your own God. That you, you would have what you really wanted. That God is withholding from you, and if you just listen to yourself, then you would achieve the thing that you really wanted. And so it says the devil works like that, and then it, he says the, there's a fourth century theologian that, that painted the picture. The, the, the devil is like a fisherman, and he, he throws out bait, right? He, he throws out bait, and he throws out the thing that's going to entice you. He's going to throw out the thing that's going to draw you in, the thing that looks shiny, the thing that looks nice, the thing that is going to get you hooked. And he says that you, you have the flesh. It says that we are we, the, the flesh, the desires of our heart, the, the brokenness inside of us that wants what we want, regardless of what God says. That, that we, we, we want to do relationships like we want to, and we want to use our money like we want to, and we want to treat people like we want to, regardless of what God says, because there's something inside of us that says, hey, it's all about me. And he'll throw out that bait, and he'll wait for you to catch it, and he'll reel you in. And then it says there's also the world, that the, the world is actively influencing you through culture, through conversations, through media, through music, through movies, that the world is, is telling you a story. I, I'm not sure if I've ever talked to you this about this before. before. Everything is trying to influence you. You are constantly trying to be influenced through your schools, your friends, the movies that you watch, the music that you listen to. Listen, I am trying to influence you right now. I am absolutely 100% trying to influence you that maybe by the power of God, you might turn to him and see him as the, the greatest joy in your life and the hope of your life and that he is good and that everything else isn't. I am absolutely trying to influence you, but not every influence is trying to point you to God. There are influences in this world that is throwing out bait to reel you in because the more that they reel you in, the further and further they pull you away from God. You are absolutely being influenced. Jesus continues his story about the strong man. It says the, the strong man guards his possessions. The, the, the enemy has power over the world and the people of the world. But Jesus continues in verse 22. He says, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he has trusted and divide his spoils. Whoever is not with me is against me and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Remember, I told you that the context of this passage isn't about us encountering supernatural evil. The context of this passage is what happens when Jesus encounters supernatural evil. It says the strong man has you bound, but the stronger man comes. Satan is the strong man, but Jesus is the stronger man. And he sees his children captive and he busts down doors and he's ready to throw hands to get back his family. He says he's gonna come and take what is his. He's the stronger man. The, the, if you look in Matthew, you want to see how evil uh, responds when Jesus comes around? Jesus is just doing his Jesus thing, and he's going around teaching and healing, and he encounters a demon. The demon's like cowering in a corner. He's like, Jesus, are, are you coming to take care of me before the appointed time? That was the response of evil in that moment. He says, Jesus, I know we're throwing hands, but I thought I had some more time before you beat me down. That, that is the response. It's not this dualistic battle of good versus evil and who's going to win. They are running scared, counting out the days that Jesus is, finishes it all and comes back. And the, the only thing that they can do until that point is try and influence you as much as they can and pull you further and further and further away from God. Jesus is the stronger man. Here's my final point for you guys today. 
the power fighting for you is greater than the powers against you. The power fighting for you is greater than the powers fighting against you. Like I said earlier with the the shark analogy, we are wading into the waters of the supernatural and there is a reality of supernatural things that don't have our best interest at heart and want to influence us to pull us further and further away from God, but you are not without help. Because if you are in this room and you are a believer in Christ, the stronger man has come in and he's rescued you and he's given you his power that is stronger than any other power that you can come against. He hasn't left you alone to try and figure it out by yourself. He hasn't left you alone to fight by yourself. He says, my power is available to you. And that same passage we looked at earlier in Ephesians where Paul was acknowledging the, the, the idea that there is spiritual realities at war. He says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but, but principalities and, and the spiritual realm. In that same passage, he says this right here. He says, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He says, there is strength available to you from God who is stronger than anything that can come against you. And he says, as you access that strength that's available, you're able to fight against the influences of the enemy that is trying to pull you further and further away from him. So how how do we fight? I have three things for you right here. Number one, we remember that the most powerful one has already won the battle and he is on our side. The battle is already over. The, the end has already been determined. We're just waiting for it to play out. And we're on the winning side. Second thing we can do is that we can pray. We can pray because when Jesus instructs us to pray to the Father, it gives us access to the Father and the Father wants to help his children. He doesn't want his children wandering into darkness and he doesn't want his children influenced by the world and being pulled further and further away from him. And so when we pray and ask for help, And when we pray and we ask for guidance and when we pray and we ask for power to fight against the evil that is around us, he is good to give it. That's not something that he withholds from you. We can pray. And the last thing is we can walk in obedience. Like I said, the world gets so consumed with the the, the, the supernatural and the sense of demon possession and supernatural events and, and all of these things But when we walk in obedience, evil has no foothold in our life. When we walk in obedience, there's no area for us to get pulled away from. In Romans chapter 16, verse 19, he says it like this. For your obedience is known to all so that I rejoice over you, but I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent and as to what is evil. So as we be obedient... We're able to be wise, to have wisdom, to understand what is good and innocent and what is evil. And he says, as we be obedient, it says the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. It's not just that God is in the Satan crushing business, but he's given you the power as you walk in obedience that anything the enemy puts in front of your way, you just step on it as you keep on walking with Jesus. He's given you that kind of, of power. He finishes, he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Students, my prayer for you, like I said at the beginning, I don't want us to be on this side where we're so overwhelmed with the supernatural that we we, we think everything is a spiritual attack and, you know, we tripped on our shoelace because the demons are after us. That's not healthy or helpful. 
but I also don't want us to be over here and be unaware that there is supernatural around us. And our hope isn't in our own power. Our hope is in the power, the fight that has already been fought through what Jesus has already done. And he's given us his power. So we, we, we don't run scared. We walk in confidence and in obedience, knowing that he is with us and fighting for us. I hope that encourages you. Pray with me.